Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. And thank you guys for being here. Uh, so we're here to talk about immersive storytelling, which is wide spectrum of different kinds of experiences. And thank you guys. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, just curious to know how many of you in the audience have are working on immersive and or are interested in okay, a couple people. Um, yeah, it's interesting in the last few years, like the numbers are, are growing. Um, initially, it was like, I don't know what that is. And, and now it's encouraging to know um, how many people are kind of working in this space. So um, I think just to begin, um, just go through. And if you can describe a little bit about your current role and what kinds of like VR, AR, um, other kinds of forms that you're currently working on. Hi, I'm Haley Pappas. Thank you for having us. Um, so I'm chief content officer at Riot, where um, you know we produce and finance a slate of both uh, traditional and immersive content. So what that breaks down into is a slate of feature documentaries, short documentaries on the traditional side, and then on the immersive side, we explore in all sorts of new emerging formats and technologies. So um, a host of virtual reality films, augmented reality films and experiences. Um, we play around a lot with live motion capture and are exploring a lot of what, what does storytelling look like or what could storytelling look like in a new 5G world. Um, very happy to have had the pleasure of working with many people up on this stage. And I don't know if we want to show a teaser. Now we had a little sizzle of some yeah, of our work. We can now contextualize. Yeah, we can play the Riot clip now. Awesome. Yeah, so... I don't, um, we can keep going, but um, you'll see there's obviously a host of different sort of storytelling types and formats in there. And uh, when I started in January of 2015 at the company, we were mostly focused on documentaries and news. Um, and in that spring, I produced our first VR piece. And now looking back, obviously, it's the most horrendous rudimentary thing I've ever <laughs> seen. It was on solitary confinement and just like one uh, photo, essentially, in 360. But um, we did a lot in 360 journalism in the beginning. We worked at the New York Times some. And now, um, as the years have gone on, I think what's become really interesting to us is uh, exploring and experimenting what these new mediums can do for storytelling um, and how it can shape uh, how creators, writers, directors um, craft a narrative and then also how we as an audience interact with them. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to be here and have this conversation. Cool. Jessica? I want to have a cool reel. <laughs> uh, sadly. Um, but um, hi, I'm Jessica. Uh, I, my company's called Ray Pictures. Um, that's my logo. It's going to slowly fade in and out of various logos. But um, uh, that's my contribution to the assets that we have here today. Um, my company, I, I built it after I left Google because I felt it was very important to be very reactive in this space. Right now, there are all sorts of varying technologies that exist, and they're a bit siloed. And we all try to think, like, this is VR, and then this is AR, and this is AI, and this is whatever. And it, and they all eventually are working together towards some immersive something uh, that brings people into new realities and it challenges the way that we exist and we, how we communicate as well. And what, um, what I'm interested in artistically and what my company wants to do and strive for is not really think of it so much as the letters, <laughs> even though that's how I got our name. Um, it's also about the truth of the thing. Like, what are we actually trying to do here? Um, and so uh, I can't announce any of my projects yet, but I very soon will be able to, which is very exciting. But um, uh, one's an AR uh, piece. Actually, there are two AR pieces. One's an audio-only AR piece. One is an AR piece. There's a game. There's a VR series. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is incorporating different elements of different things and uh, seeing what we can make and how we can impact people. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yes, man, you want to go on? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, a little bit about, um, I, I'm Yasmin Elayad, and I'm uh, one of the co-founders at Scatter. We're based here in Brooklyn. And um, I wanted to define what we, when we're saying we're, you know, our work as an immersive media is volumetric filmmaking. What we mean by that is um, we're seeing a future where there's a collision of the film industry and the gaming industry. And we're trying to forge a future where um, you can actually leverage the power and flexibility of game engines, but, but 
and leverage your, you know, the current workflows and the craft and sensibility of filmmaking. And so how we do that is we're actually kind of a hybrid company. We, um, we build tools. So my two partners build a tool that is for filmmakers to kind of forge their way into this space. And we're trying to make it easier and more accessible to be able to like translate how you film into and you know filmmaking into this um, immersive media space, and on the other hand, and this is what I had is that the, we make films, we make immersive content, leveraging the tool and um, uh, just trying to define what what this means. And the reason we say immersive media is we see everything uh, in this space as kind of almost the same language, VR, AR, and mixed reality. Um, for us, it's the same process, and it's it's just different output. So uh, we just say immersive media studio. Um, that being said, I'm going to show not a sizzle reel, but um, our, our project um, film called Zero Days, which is a documentary, uh, and it is an adaptation of the Alex Gibney film uh, from 2016, and our adaptation take, tells a story from the perspective of Stuxnet and tries to really uh, immerse you in, a, in an intangible world of code and, and cyber warfare. Um, so with that, maybe we can yeah. show it. Great. Okay. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, I mean, I, I, we want to get to you know talking about what stories work and how the storytelling process is you know different. Um, but I think if we can just if you can briefly describe a little bit about your transition to how you got moved into doing uh, these kinds of forms, uh, I think that's super helpful. I myself, my background is was in television news and in documentary and digital video and I started doing 360 video uh, from a very like documentary storytelling perspective and that's how I started working at the Times um, and that's been kind of my journey and I often say that I use a lot of the same principles come from a very like journalistic um, documentary uh, background and when I'm in the field or on the ground that I use those kinds of uh, you know, processes even when filming. Um, so just curious to know a little bit about your backgrounds. Yeah, um, so I first got into VR uh, before I joined Riot actually. I um, worked with a dear friend and mentor, Rose Trache, on her first VR piece, Perspective, um, which was at Sundance in 20, I don't, 2015, 2016, I don't remember what years these were. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I think from Riot's perspective, we we started as a as a film and news company, right? And um, when we started, we were a news site that was connecting every story with an action. So we were really rooted in this place of how can we get our audiences, um, our viewers, our consumers, our participants closer to the story, um, in an attempt to move them move them to do more than just consume that story, but engage with that story in one way or another. At the time, when we first started, it was you know taking whatever action was associated with that aggregated piece of news, whether it was signing a petition or whatever, donating, signing up to volunteer. And so for us, technology had always been, and, and uh, the development of new technologies for storytelling had been really interesting, and how can we place our audiences closer, in, you know, more inside of the story to change their experience that hopefully we can evoke more of a feeling or an emotion, drive them to act more so. So we'd always been super interested in virtual reality, and it wasn't until the spring of 2015 when the technology finally um, became accessible enough that we could take it out into the field with us. You know, we'd been we'd made documentaries for a while that were sort of um, in various different natural disasters or crises, um, and and the hardware just wasn't there. You know, we couldn't travel with what was a VR camera at the time, and so it wasn't until those first sort of rudimentary GoPro cameras came out that we were like, oh, this is something we can really take with us and can can change the way that we are. Um, breaking news, that we're telling stories, and that was sort of the, the tipping point for us, right? Um, and, and at that moment in time in 2015, I think we made the conscious choice. Um, we, we could have taken one of two paths, right? We could have either focused on a few really high quality, high impact, you know, like 10 out of 10 projects, um, or we could go really far and wide and be producing a larger scale and, and quantity of them. And I think we chose that approach. Um, our, our idea was uh, if we can get 360 journalism, 
into the hands of consumers, you know, just on their phones, moving it around, then perhaps we can start to penetrate the zeitgeist a bit and make it somewhat more accessible. Um, that was sort of our point of entry, and that led to us being acquired ultimately by Verizon and further stepping into, obviously, an interest in how do we consume stories on our mobile devices, how do we share stories on our mobile devices, tell stories on our mobile devices. Um, and since then, I would say we've pivoted our focus a little bit. Um, you know, away from that idea of 360 journalism and into more, sto more so um, experimenting with the formats and technologies and uh, how can we continue to sort of stretch, uh, stretch our capabilities. Um, so, you know, we, we launched, a s we built out a studio um, that has sort of live, um, live motion capture capabilities, for instance. Um, and, and, and we're playing more and more with, uh, what do what does storytelling look like in these new mediums? It's so much unknown, right? It's so much unknown until we create it or play around with it. Um, that I think that that's sort of where where we are now and, and a bit of how we got there. Um, and now for us, it's just ultimately about how do we how do we continue to prove that this is a really viable format, right? Yeah. Oh, I just had engineers come up to me and say, <laughs> "Hey, here's a thing we made with a bunch of GoPros. What do you think?" And I was at Google. I was there. Yeah. there I Technology in my career have been very, been arm in arm, like I almost became a computer yeah. scientist. And I did film because I got into NYU and I was like, I have to do film. My dad was furious and it was fine. But, um, and then I went, I would run across the street to the Cron Institute of Mathematical Sciences and take a computer class and run back to NYU. Now you have, you know, I didn't know about ITP, which is a great program and combines all sorts of great things. And I was just oblivious to all of it. So, um, but then I got to Google. I was their first filmmaker there, worked at the Creative Lab for five years. And during my time there, it was very rare to have an engineer email you. You usually had 10 layers between you and an engineer for a lot of reasons. Um, but I got an email from an engineer that says, we're working on what we think is an immersive live action rig. We'd, we'd love to be able to work with you on it. Because they didn't want to go public or talk to filmmakers yet. They wanted someone within the company to vet it before they decided to even remotely reach out to anybody else. So I said, all right, well, well, actually, I ignored the email the first time. I thought it was a mistake, so I didn't email, I didn't respond. <laughs> and then they responded later being like, you know, this isn't a joke, we really want you to do this. And so I, I did the unthinkable by all Google standards, which is I just sort of didn't tell my, I told my bosses, but not all of it. I was like, I need to go to California, and then like flew to Seattle instead, and uh, to meet with these engineers <laughs> and meet with the team. And um, I saw this basically maker bot thing, like a plastic rig with these 16 GoPros. I hate one GoPro and suddenly I had 16. <laughs> I was looking at being like, I don't even know how to turn it on. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, we'll do something. I was like, what do, you, what do you want me to do? They're like, I don't know, like whatever filmmakers do, like put it on a dolly or something. And I was like, a dolly? And I realized just how completely unaware they were of like what the process was. And so I became, I looked at the rig and I was like, okay, and I didn't realize it at the time, but that was really the beginning of everything. I realized um, that, that afternoon, Clay Bavor came in, and he's the VP of that whole immersive team at Google, and he basically said, at that meeting, we're going to announce this at Google I.O. And he looked at me and said, and you're the one who's going to make the film. And I had literally just seen this thing. And I was like, my boss doesn't know I'm here. <laughs> I, I've just seen this crazy GoPro thing. I don't know what it does. Uh, they asked me to put on a dolly. I don't know if they even know what that is. And I um, now have to go make stuff. So I, I went on a journey, really. I just, I took a Kurt Vonnegut quote about, you know, hello babies, welcome to earth. I was like, that's structure. And then I went around the world and uh, filmed with this thing that I've never barely used in my life. Um, and I learned a lot. And I came back and learned, sort of suddenly found my brain reshaping itself to think much more broadly, less about storytelling, I think, and more about the capacity for stories to exist in the space that I create, which was a lot more like game design and architecture and all these other mediums that I was very fascinated by but never really paid attention to until now in any sort of serious way. And my, my filmmaking brain, sort of like when you learn another language and then you found yourself in that country, and it's really hard to separate the two now. And so I've become this fusion creator artist that moves through the medium looking for new weird rigs to break and explore, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a really unique and like common um, ex 
experience in the sense that continues today that the storytellers and the creators work really closely with people like developing the technology and like you're kind of pushing the technology and the storytelling like it goes hand in hand um, and that's something to consider as well. Uh, Yasmin, you want to talk about your how you got into this? Yeah, um, I, uh, it's funny, I, I'm not a filmmaker, uh, and I should, I, I had a, I was at a lab last, for in South Africa last week, when that's when the first questions, um, one of the students asked me, and I was like, actually, I am the, I am the computer scientist who uh, stumbled into this world, so I, I'm a computer scientist who went to art school and was working as a software engineer and creative technologist in, uh, you know, the interactive exhibit space. I was working, doing these large scale, scale installations for the Museum of the Holocaust in LA and Muse Museum of Science and Industry, and like, that's what I used to do, and it's, it's, it still was, it was like technology-driven storytelling, but it was really about thinking spatially and how people move through a space and how do you, nav you know, tell stories through space, and um, it was around 2011 when I f kind of stumbled into the film and documentary world where when the Egyptian Revolution started, I quit my job and I joined forces with uh, uh, Jay Garmeta, who used to be at the New York Times. He was a video journalist there and moved to Egypt and was working on a documentary on the revolution. But of course, because of what my background was, it wasn't a traditional documentary. It was completely participatory and was like, how can a country write their own history? And I was trying to figure out how to do that. And it was a, more of a platform um, uh, and you know, a non-linear non sort of uh, storytelling project. Um, and I would say that's kind of where my entry, so I come from a, a, that kind of background. And uh, for me, like, uh, I call myself an artist more than I call myself an artist who works with technology. Like, that's sort of what I've been doing for most of my career before VR. And it was mostly public installations and using co-creating with the audience is what I used to do. And I feel like VR is almost like the next stage. It felt like such a natural move. So when um, I moved back to New York, I met my two partners and it was just like, we happened to each other. We just had such similar missions and interests in, what, in this space and it just made sense to work together. Um, as they obviously are, are forging the tools and I just wanted to figure out well, what can we make and what is the future of documentary and nonfiction narrative in this space. Um, so I would say that's how I stumbled uh, into this world. And, I think what's exciting for me is just like the fact that it, it's oh, there's so many ways to bend and break the rules and bend the form of nonfiction storytelling and um, uh, I th that's sort of what drives me and what's exciting to me. Um, and obviously because we have a mission to make things more accessible um, from a tools perspective and from a, um, a like a a accessibility of tools but also how can we think of distribution in different ways and, uh, and that sort of thing. So I think like we're kind of as a, so that's me personally, but as a company, we're kind of in a tricky space where, yes, we're artists and we're making these the, this original content and telling stories we really believe are important. And for us, it's any story that is pretty relevant to today, and that's why it's mostly nonfiction. Um, but I also, um, how do you then enable other people and how do you push these tools to other creators? Also very diverse voices, and that's very important to us and part of our mission. So it's like a two-pronged yeah. uh, mission. I'm actually just to jump off that to you know I'm curious about um, you know the storytelling like ideation process in terms of like what works and and what you you know at scatter what you're you know thinking is especially with like zero days because this is like coming off of like you have a traditional documentary and then you're creating an immersive experience so what is it that's like that the regular documentary couldn't bring to it and you know how what are the what's the different unique angle and you know how what's the thinking behind that uh, yeah, I mean, that this one is a very, it's, it was an interesting sort of uh, uh, background. So when we, we actually worked with, with Alex Gibney on the feature film, so the context is, Alex Gibney, when he was working on the film, he wanted, he had an NSA informant for, I'm sure everyone's seen this film, and the NSA character, um, he wanted to digitize her in a way that felt native to the language of code, that it wasn't just like, you know, digitizing the voice or just like, you know, hiding the face. And so he actually used uh, DepthKit, our tool, to, as a VFX tool in the feature film. And what's interesting is because we already filmed the NSA informant with our tool, it means we already had a volumetrically captured mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were pitching him the whole time, can we like, we need to make a VR piece. This is like cyber warfare, this is perfect for VR. Um, and uh, at the time, I think it wasn't, that, you know, they're busy with the film, obviously. Um, and what we did is literally we made it like, a, we hacked one night, all three of us, and we like built a little prototype and we showed it to Gibney and he's like, make this. Like, he, like he, all we did was put the informant in an NSA office, and that's it. And 
Um, the, the difference in what we were trying to do in our adaptation is, um, in the film also, Gibney really says this, he poses this question in the beginning few minutes, I believe, he says something like, how do you make a documentary where your lead character is code, where code could speak for itself? And for us, that was like the call to action. It's like the whole, the whole adaptation was, how do you completely tell the story and let code speak for itself? So Stuxnet is a character, um, the Iranian cyber army is a character, um, you know, are in, uh, as equal footing with the NSA informant. And so, um, and we used archival material uh, to tell, like basically what we wanted to do was create these worlds where you have the public tight-lipped government stance, official stance, which is like archival material and like nobody will tell you actually what's happening or acknowledge their involvement in Stuxnet or, or cyber warfare um, or building these weapons. And then we create our, our digital insider world and that's where you learn the real story from real NSA testimony and government officials who are willing to talk, ex-CIA uh, CIA and NSA, and also from, um, what's it called, uh, cyber experts who literally you know, puzzle pieces through the, you know, in the code, they could figure out where, you know, trace it back to the, who, it's, who, it's, you know, who made it. Um, and so that's what we did. We just relied on a lot of the archival, but we retold it from the perspective of, of, of Stuxnet, let it, letting Stuxnet speak for itself. Yeah, I mean, these are really like visceral experiences and, you know, sometimes, you know, it's an opportunity to just like create a completely alternative inverse kind of perspective. Um, and so um, that's what's really exciting about working in this. Um, Jessica, I'm just curious, like in terms of you're at Google, they're like, we want to just like make stories and figure out how to how to do this. Like how, where do you start? How did you start to figure out what works for it and what have you found? Well, I think I had a good, I got a, a lucky break because mm -hmm. I was working with a piece of technology that could actually stitch together these really complex images. Yeah. So I got a lot of stuff back for it fairly quickly. And you just feel it, you just know if it works or not. It's it's sort of, I think Nani De La Pina said this, and I, I who's been doing this much longer yeah. than me, but she said um, something to the effect of, like someone's like, well if you can't, if you can't have like a lens, if, if you, how do you know it's gonna turn out okay? Like you can't actually see what you're capturing, like how do you do that? I think now you, there are ways, but before you, you couldn't. You'd literally set up the rig and then hide underneath it or run away. And that was the only two options. And so what she said, and I really resonate, it re resonated with me because it's exactly how I felt, was that you just stand there. Mm -hmm. And do you feel what you want someone to feel? Like, does it feel like that to you? And it's hard to be objective sometimes, but there, there are distinct feelings of this feels great or this doesn't feel great or this is the emotion. You actually just have to be there, which is a very rare thing. A filmmaker is like, what? I have to be there. That's not the point. But for VR, it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that switch from understanding what presence does, understanding what it means to be somewhere and what that does to someone, the idea of resonance, you know, it's not just that I'm there, it's this as I look, there's some responsiveness to this world in me. Um, that things are constantly flowing and that the tension matters and engagement matters and elements like you know, doors and stairwells and how moving with the crowd and then the crowd leaves you, you suddenly feel upset. Like the, the nuances of experience suddenly become very, very potent. Mm -hmm. And I think once my brain started to kind of recognize that, I think that's when things started to change for me. And when it became a little bit less about you know, s my story, and much more about the potential for story to exist. And my job was really to craft the best kinds of experiences where the greatest stories could emerge. And as long as I could really dilute it to like its very fundamental core, the truth of it, um, which in film you would just see the frame, and a lot of people have different interpretations, but generally the atom is much more condensed. But th in, in, in VR it's like the truth really needs to be there because people are gonna come out of there looking at the chicken instead of the person, it just happens, you know, yeah. it's just what people do. And so you have to be okay with that. Um, and at the end of it, that's when you realize whether or not you crafted correctly as if at the end they still get it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that, all of that sort of led to really understanding what it meant to make stuff in this space. Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes when I'm reviewing, you know, 360 footage, I'm like, I don't even look at the, um, the first time I look at it, I'm not even trying to figure out like, which, what was the log sheet, what was the shot, I'm just like looking at it purely and trying to see like what footage is like 
really like feeling, you know, feeling that presence and, and feeling really like strong and then, and then looking at it from there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and go ahead. Jessica, I think to build on what you were saying, my experience has been with, you know, VR creators and directors and storytellers is a bit of like, you have to let go of that agency and authority and give it up to the person consuming the experience, right? Because in so many ways they become their own storyteller because they chose to look at the chicken. And that, that is, that is the point, yeah. right? That like uh, you can have such varying experiences based on your own navigation through it yeah that uh, giving up that control is 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 an interesting thing um for riot you know you guys started with 360 video and have like since um done a lot of the other you know move forward into these like longer larger projects what did you learn from like the 360 that worked for it that like you you guys are like continuing to use Oh God, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I it's uh, we're learning every day. It's like, what did we learn in 360? Like, you know, we learned some things, and then the next week, they were irrelevant because the technology had changed. Like that happens so quickly and yeah. so rapidly. So some of it is that letting go and understanding a that things are changing rapidly. B that the audience or the consumer has a lot of agency in that me this medium, and that's part of the beauty of it. Um, you know. And then, and then there are things that like, I think we all can talk about, like directing s sort of takes a different shape in that it's uh, more like, s it's more of a spatial act, right? Like um, lighting and sound cues can have a bit more um, control. Uh, but I don't know, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that perhaps we craved in when we, uh, throughout that sprint of 360 journalism and what's made us move into um, you know, more like room scale experiences or interactive experiences is continuing to explore the user's agency. Um, you know, we, we premiered an augmented reality experience called Terminal 3 at, at Tribeca this year. And, um, and it's an experience in which the viewer is placed in the position of uh, an airport interrogation officer. And it's a piece that explores Muslim identities. Um, as, as the viewer, you are forced to interrogate a hologram of a Muslim individual coming into the United States. Um, and, and it's this really interactive and raw and authentic experience where your questions, uh, you know, your questions prompt a variety of different answers and you can take a variety of different paths and then this individual's fate is ultimately up to you whether they're allowed a access and entry or not. Um, and so, you know, I think to s it's hard to say exactly just what we did learn from 360, that 360 sprint. I think what we learned is that we have to love the process of learning <laughs> and continuing to iterate. Um, I think that every piece now, um, we're constantly sort of, you know, looking back on and digesting like what worked there? What did we like? What do we want to stretch and play more with? Um, and what maybe isn't sitting that much. And it's what's interesting about that is like I feel like a lot of it is about unpacking why we do any of this stuff in the first place. Yeah. Like why do we edit? Like people are like, we need to edit. I'm like, but why? Yeah. Like we didn't just choose to edit because editing. Like we, you know, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's like if you look at, you know, like look at Vertov, it's like he just did it because he's like, I have all this footage, I want to do this, and he did it. And Eliza, his wife, did a lot of it, but he did it, you know, like, and I think that that was the, that was kind of that weird moment where, for me especially, it was, it's, it's the tension points that matter. It's like, well, why can't I do this the same way that I used to do it before? And it's usually at those tension points where the, the medium is actually like, this is what I do. And it's like not so much like what it can do, but what it what it seems like it can't, but it's like it's not quite can't, it's more like it's just a different perspective and a different way of handling it. So I think that unpacking, that learning is actually really important because otherwise it's just an extremely frustrating experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of the stuff I've learned, especially in my craft, has been a lot about just being like, okay, I can't yeah. do this, obviously, in the way that I've been doing it, so how else can I achieve that feeling in this medium through another means? Is there another way to do this? Or is that, the tension there is meaning that I need to use this for something else entirely. Mm -hmm. I wanna now just um, jump to uh, thinking a little bit about, um, you know, you, just the project that you mentioned made me think of this, like the, the perspectives that we choose to include in stories, and this is just like a you know larger issue in storytelling, like whose stories get to be told, what are the voices that are included. Um, but I think 
we have um, you know a unique opportunity here because you really when somebody is going into a you know very like VR experience you're, you're seeing it from a very specific perspective even if you are you know having that agency of which way to take it um, and so kind of thinking about like what have you guys thought about like you know what are is that something that like you know motivates you what are some of like the unique kinds of perspectives of you know like for you know, from journalism, like I got into journalism because I was really interested, interested in, uh, you know, giving in hearing voices from like vulnerable communities and marginalized groups. Um, and that's kind of what I've worked on even with VR. So just kind of wondering what you guys um, think about that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love, I mean, for me, this is something that's really key. Uh, uh, even back in, when I was talking about 18 days in Egypt in 2011, I'm Egyptian, but I still felt like this is not my story. I want, it felt like it was like a grass, you know, grassroots, leaderless, um, uh, you know, people on the ground telling this story. And so the, whatever film we made, we're not the filmmakers, they had to be the filmmakers. And I think almost that's kind of the like ethos and, and how I think we even work now. Obviously, Zero Days was a bit different. It's very linear and it has to, had to do with the journalistic integrity, so we could not kind of explore that in a different way. But um, I have two kind of examples of, of how we think about it, and it's not like one size fits all. I think there's every story demands, has different needs, and it's just like following what each one demands. But um, we had one project as an example of like how we were thinking about it. It's like kind of like how can you um, empower New Yorkers to tell the story of like sort of um, you know post-Trump uh, America's very divi you know divisive and polarizing political climate. Um, and so this project is called Blackout, and we wanted to just really figure out a way to crowdsource or at least uh, be a, create a participatory documentary where average New Yorkers, people we were finding in the street that had very different opinions and completely disagreed with each other, um, but kind of represented sort of like what was going on in, in the United States from like people who did agree with the Muslim ban and rescinding DACA and were Trump supporters to those who are you know, on the other side of it. And um, we created this um, uh, documentary that is essentially uh, um, completely nonlinear. Uh, you're almost kind of like you're on the subway train and you can have this ability to, to hear the thoughts and the minds of the strangers around you. And so these people would, you know, you know, kind of tell that what their most heartfelt stories, their fears, their whatever they're thinking about. Um, and you'd hear these kind of completely, as I said, like um, um, ideologies that kind of clash or um, kind of uh, how people, you know, the honest opinion of what they believe about, like kind of why they believe these things that they believe um, ideologically. And the idea was through how you navigate the space, who you choose to spend time with, the space left between was as for you, the audience member, to kind of connect the dots and hopefully there's some dialogue there. But for us, we thought that was like the way of like removing ourselves as filmmakers and saying, well, can, can New Yorkers tell the story themselves? Can our, the neighborhood, you know, tell, or the people in our community tell the story? And um, another example, the reason I, about who can tell the story, I think part of it, especially in this space, is about like, again, like the access to cre creating this work. Like, it's actually, sometimes you have to have a team, it's not cheap, it's like uh, funding, there's like other hurdles and learning curves. Um, but the idea is like, if we, if it can be, like, like if we can kind of like remove some of those obstacles, I believe there'll be more diversity of voices. And I just wanted to talk about one, project that's happening here in Brownsville. And for those who don't know Brownsville, it's a you know, neighborhood in Brooklyn, which has like, I think the highest death expectancy in, 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 the, in, the, in all boroughs. It has uh, high crime rates. Um, I, I think it was like one in six um, men who grew up in Brownsville end up incarcerated. It was like these crazy statistics, don't quote me on them, but it's like, you know, it, and there's um, a community, like a youth community there. They're all kids and they're like, I don't know, teens and tw early 20s. And they're like, we want to tell the story of Brownsville in our way. And the reason we know about them, because they were like, we'll use Death Kit, because it was like, you know, it's cheap, easy to use for them to start. And they started building a documentary game that's like them telling their, like owning their own narrative. And they're, rep they're interviewed 100 people in their community. And um, it's like about, they, they think of it, they think of VR as new real estate. That's like actually the language they use. This is our real estate. And they're owning the narrative and changing it. And the idea is like to, to put these kiosks where different people can actually um, it played this game, it's called Fireflies of Brownsville, in their own community, and hopefully meet the people that they um, normally don't go say hi to just across the street uh, because of the, you know, the different conflicts um, in, the, in this neighborhood. Um, I don't know if that, I, yeah. yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's cool. It's great to hear these like specific ideas, I think, um, and wanna, you know, get your, you know, your Haley and Jessica, your thoughts as well, but I also wanna just like raise also this, uh, 
access issue. Um, and you know, you can speak to that about like journalism, documentary, film, all of these industries are struggling with, you know, diversity and representation and like this is a new medium and you know we're working off of you know a mix of these offshoots and you know what are just another th uh, question to keep in mind is like you know what are the ways that we can avoid perpetuating these problems or you know how are you like overcoming some of these challenges yeah no i i could not agree more i mean the hardware and technology is expensive and who has it you know what i mean and and schools don't even have art programs public schools don't even have art programs nonetheless like immersive technology programs so yes it is a problem i think one thing from our perspective we have intentionally over the past like uh, several months um focused a decent amount of our funding onto sort of labs and incubators and programs um, with a variety of different institutions for just that, to try to like bring in more creators from various different walks of life, you know? And um, and I think all some of that is also like inviting people from other from other industries who have yet to be exposed to this to this medium and these technologies and the capabilities. This I think it was this past weekend we did an incubator called Dev Lab with Kaleidoscope and Oculus. We recently launched a program with IFP here in New York. Like it, to me, it feels so so yes so important that we make all of this accessible, even just that we make the knowledge of it accessible. Um, and, and then the second part of that is the consumption of this content. Um, you know, it's not just the ability to create it, but also the ability to consume it or experience it. Um, I feel passionately that, and I know that there are foundations and institutions working to implement some of this, but in our public spaces, we need access to this, right? It, it will entirely change the game if we can have um, virtual reality headsets in a public library, you know, or in any of these public community spaces where it's it's moving it out of sort of the ivory tower <laughs> and these elitist communities of festivals where how lucky are we to get to see and experience and interact with this content, but you know, who has the ability to pay for a pass to go there? So yeah, I, it's, it's absolutely a problem and I think that until we solve those two problems, the, the viability of the medium will really hurt because of it. I mean, I also think there's, when we say access, there's access and there's accessibility, right? So a lot of the work that I've been doing lately is also thinking very much about accessibility, accessibility as well as access. Um, you know, growing up, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania. I don't know if anyone's from Pennsylvania, but I grew up in like kind of farm country, podunk, you know. And uh, it, you know, I learned how to edit on Final Cut by going to a Borders and buying the cheapest thing I could get, which was like a green tea, I think. And it was a Final Cut 3 manual, and that's not, I don't recommend that to anybody, but I like went through it, jotted down notes, I put all the filters on, I mean, I was, I was really into it, and I, I taught, my dad was really like a novice, or he was like a, uh, he was really into like all the new programs, so I don't know where he got them, but he somehow managed to get them. I know I ask questions about that, but. Um, and so I have a lot of, uh, in my heart of hearts, I really do care about getting a lot of this stuff to the people who are usually the last people to get it or last people to, to experience it for one reason or another, whether because they're in the middle of nowhere or, um, or they're you know, someone who's partially deaf and usually they have to wear some crazy contraption thing or maybe the experience is not for them. Like they go to these festivals and say like, how, how can I do this? And yeah. I don't know. Um, one of the great things, you know, thinking about other new technologies, like thinking about haptics and how that could finally bridge that. Like uh, the last yeah. piece I did at Google was uh, Beethoven's Fifth. I was trying to do this very large documentary project around Voyager's 40th anniversary and the golden record and bringing all that content to VR in some sort of capacity. And it was a great idea. I still believe in it. Uh, it fell apart for all sorts of reasons. But I got a couple of things through. The first was this Beethoven's Fifth piece. Um, I got Subpack, which is a company that usually makes these uh, haptic backpacks for video game folks. So like, you put it, you play World, World of Warcraft, and you can feel the dragon. I don't know, but the the idea is that you know you you put you bring that you you bring that to something like Beethoven, who inadvertently was a composer for the deaf. Like his stuff is extremely bassy, and you just plug it in and you can feel it. And I found out from someone you know, during my process that Helen Keller had actually done that by putting her hand to the radio during uh, a broadcast of Beethoven's Ninth. Mm -hmm. 
and had suddenly felt so emotionally involved with something that she could not, she could, there's nothing she could do other than feel it. And she understood the difference between the violins and the brass and the woodwinds. And, and she knew something very deeply about that that she would never have known otherwise. And so we brought that to the experience as well. And we had a lot of people go through it who were deaf. Mm -hmm. And they felt like this was the first experience where it was less about Beethoven's Fifth and more about the ex our relationship with audio, right? And that actually completely changed the narrative of what that piece was about. So I think thinking about how do we get it, you know, thinking about like, this stuff isn't going to matter if we don't get it to the home, that it doesn't become something that people can just experience easily. Immersive content doesn't answer a question. This isn't an iPhone. <laughs> like people are like, it's the iPhone. It's not the iPhone. Mm -hmm. This is li the iPhone solved it because we needed something to access the internet and to find directions and all that stuff in our pocket. That was what the iPhone was for. We presented an immersive piece of technology and said, you need this. And everyone's like, why? You know? And I think we need to come with an answer to that. And it, it's like the being making the bespoke pieces is is great, but you know, and pl platform is a very unsexy thing to say, but we need that. Otherwise this doesn't matter. Yeah. And we don't deserve to matter. In that's in, in the co in the consciousness of, of the public. So, um, access on that front matters. Accessibility for a number of reasons matters, and will and both things will only make us thrive and make our work better. Yeah, this makes me think about how earlier this year the the New York Times launched AR, and you know, with all of these experiences, you're trying to explain how to consume it while you're you know releasing it. Yeah, so it's like you know educational awareness and just we were like checking ourselves on the language that we're using because we're trying to be like okay walk around it but then you know like you know is what if someone you know cannot walk around it and so you know what is the what's the alternative language and you know who is this for who's consuming it and and stuff like that so i think we're like um getting close to question times but um opening it up to other questions but i just want to like and here on thinking about like your audience and which we've like touched a little bit about, but like ideas on how do you guys think about expanding your audience? You know, we mentioned like accessibility for, you know, VR headsets and things like that. But, you know, as we know, like audience informs the stories we tell and so it's this like constant loop <laughs> going back and forth. So yeah, any thoughts? I'll start. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, I think, the biggest pain point, uh, I would say, for us. Um, when we think about audience, every piece we do, a lot of it obviously is like the high-end headsets and game, like gaming PCs that are cost you know, thousands of dollars, so it's not very accessible, but that's like the best way to experience it. But we always build into everything, every project that is going to be distributed or exhibited, a uh, what we call tiers of distribution. So even though Zero Days is on the type of headsets I'm talking about and these are the type of machines, uh, it is also now on every iPhone and Android device. Uh, they can watch as a two, or the web, it's actually on the web um, for free if anyone wants to see it. And that was like really important to us to make sure. And part of it was like literally my parents can't see it because they live in Egypt. And I was like, I just want people in Egypt and everywhere else in the world to like have access to Zero Days VR. Um, so it, it, it is a big problem. And just to even get it distributed across these platforms costs a lot. It, it's actually not easy. It was e even though we're a studio, it's still not easy to get like a port. Everything doesn't, you know, everyone um, has different requirements and different standards. So it's still not easy, but at least that's how we try to do it. Um, part of it is also about uh, new types of homes. It's not just about online distribution, thinking about museums, mm -hmm. curriculums, different partners. Um, that's stuff we've been talking to about. We've done stuff in art museums because it felt like that was the right audience for a certain piece. Um, the project we're working on now with Rada Film Group is about explores racial injustice and we're working with Afropunk and we're working with other, other partners that are just different partners in thinking about where this project needs to live. Um, and th so that's on one side of audience. And I just want to mention on, on another side of audience, um, we believe this, this space is still so small and we need to all lead with education and, and help and contribute and help each other as creators and, and artists. And so we also, as Scatter, we run a, a meetup that's like a free to open to the public. It's called the Volumetric Filmmakers NYC. I know <laughs> you came to one or, or a few. And it's like meant to be, and anyone who's creating in this space, they're doing content and it's just little people who are interested in this space, let's talk to each other. Let's like show off what we're doing, what are the different techniques and tools and, and work. And it's meant to be a community building thing. And I think part of it is community building and education as well. Cool. Um, we can get started with questions if anyone has them. I see that we have a mic set up. Otherwise, we can 
keep talking. But if anyone has one, you can come. OK, great. Thank you. <laughs> Two quick questions. I'm intrigued that this is an all-girl panel, which is fantastic, in a space that sounds like it's very male-dominated. How representative are you of the industry you're in? And then my other question that occurred to me is how much inspiration or information do you draw from the 40s and 50s when we had all these supposed breakthrough technologies in terms of helping you all predict? And I was so intrigued, Yasmin, by what you were talking about, how you were um, you felt like you were on the, you were merging these two fields together in a very natural way that would sort of push the boundaries of where we're going to be um, in 10, 15, 20 years. Did you watch movies of the 40s and 50s when we were all going to have, you know, packs on our back and floating around in space and, you know, 20 years ago? If we you, do you now, though. We did. Well, <laughs> we one or two guys out in the, in oh, the yeah, desert do, you know? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. On Jupiter somewhere, yeah. <laughs> Anyone wants to start? Yeah, um, I'll talk about the second question first, I guess. Um, I, I, I think that VR often gets, yeah, I'll just use VR here, um, compared as like, uh, you know, the next step from video, and I actually really don't feel that it is that at all. Um, I think that's like maybe a misconception or an oversimplification. To me, I think we barely scrapped scratch the surface of the potential, like just barely. Um, and I think it feels more almost like literature. It may be an odd comparison, but I think that like when you, you know, when you read, um, you have the full space of your imagination to explore. And I think that with um, immersive storytelling and immersive formats, um, you're given a whole world, right? You're not limited to a frame or a stage. Um, or any sort of dimension, like it really unlocks a new, a new way of, of consuming, and that's why I think we're just now uh, scratching the surface. I think we're actually, I think we're actually being hurt by the, um, by the conventions of storytelling that we know <laughs> a little bit. I think that like we're all using, you know, uh, film, film ideologies or structures, and like let's strip it all away. Let's start from scratch. Who knows what the hell we're doing? Yeah. In terms of the, uh, I mean, I, the women um, question, I mean, I I get asked this a lot. I'm sure you guys do too. Um, encouragingly, I have met a lot of women working yeah. in VR. Um, I can't speak to like how or why, maybe somebody else knows more about that, but especially in like VR and a lot of the media organizations there are a lot of women leading that as well. So um, that's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah there's a lot. There's, there's definitely a lot. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> and it feels like whether or not they get put on panels or yeah. like I mean yeah. I don't but know. It also but feels like yeah. there's a conscious effort to like preserve that. I, I feel like there are a good number of organization, you know, women in VR and and people taking an initiative around. I mean, I hate, I'm like I'm like the worst woman in VR. Like I'm like the one that doesn't actually like to go to the women in VR things because I'm just like why does it matter? Which is a terrible thing because we should be very supportive of each other. And I, I I am. I feel like I am. But like, I never. It's like, it's just really difficult to have that conversation because it's like, but I just make stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to, as creators that are, are in, the big, in the forefront of the space, make sure that we listen to everybody and we let everybody make stuff, right? And I think it's tricky to be like, well, I mean, I think we should be women that make, but we should be makers first. And, and the women, the, the as that aspect to me, although it's important, is not like the front runner in my mind in, in doing a lot of the work that I do, so. But that said, there's some, there, Nani is one person, uh, Nancy Bennett from Two Bit Circus is another, um, you know, Yasmin is an incredible creator as well, Haley's making a lot of great stuff happen, like, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, a lot of the women that curate for festivals and bring this stuff in are also women. I mean, it's Shari, Kamal, Sinclair is great, Ingrid Cope from Tribeca, I mean, it's, there's a lot. I mean, they're not going to go up and be like, hi, ah, women are all here. It's like, it's just, we're, yeah, we're around. We're here. <laughs> hi. <laughs> I also say the funders. A lot of funders are women, too. So I don't know. It's a whole yeah. ecosystem. Yeah. Actually, um, if you can suggest or, like, offer suggestions for funding and, like, for independent filmmakers that are interested in getting in involved, you know, what are maybe incubator labs, funding opportunities that 
you know of and can suggest? Well, I think Riot's been amazing at that, actually. Yeah. One, of the bi- one of the biggest funders, I think. Not to put you on the spot. We'll, we'll not, like, don't all bump project. her project. <laughs> at once, but she's very good. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, yes, we finance immersive and maybe we're crazy for it. I don't, you know, uh, our parent company is always like, what's the revenue model on this? And then there's a fun song and dance around yeah, it and yeah. you're just buying more time. Um, but I do think there are wonderful institutions uh, who help with funding and more than anything help with community and support and n- introduction. You know, it's, uh, all of the major festivals have made such um, efforts to uh, move into immersive and incubate immersive talent and um, cultivate that. Um, I think Kaleidoscope does great work. Um, I think, and I would also say a lot of the hardware providers, you know, yeah. are obviously incentivized to see people create, and um, and out of that have come some really wonderful programs. Also, um, a lot of the tool, it's a lot easier to make stuff now. The the Weather Channel thing that was mentioned earlier, I was not asked by the Weather Channel to make something, but I was really <laughs> upset because it takes forever <laughs> to make these things happen, yeah. right? Like, I 16 GoPros. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna make something in a day, and I'm only gonna use what's online. So I actually remember when I was a kid uh, watching TV uh, in the 90s and watching the Weather Channel. Uh, and I was like, I kinda wanna make that. So I like went on YouTube, found, apparently everyone was really interested in recording the Weather Channel during the 90s, especially in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Don't know. Why? And so I found it, and so I took like one from a feed from like 89, it was like 92, 94, 96, something like that. And I put one in each quadrant, and then I played them all at once. And at the bottom, if you look down, you could see it says, Welcome to Omaha, because I made about, I called it uh, uh, Conditions at Omaha, because yeah. Weather Channel. And then you look up, and you can see an animated GIF of Kenny G playing. <laughs> and the entire space was just flooded with the sweet sounds of Kenny G. And I just released it on YouTube. And I was like, you don't have to have a headset, you just put it on your phone. And it went crazy, like people went nuts, for, including Kenny G, which was a whole yeah. weird thing. <laughs> so it's, I think it's possible now. A lot of the tools, yeah. like I worked with Adobe back when I was at Google being like, this is how I edit. And they were bringing a lot of like my ideas into like the toolkit that's now available in Premiere. So you can actually metal, which was a Premier. separate thing yeah. altogether in terms of being able to bring images and 2D content into a VR space widely available on that. So it's actually, it's not to say like, okay, everyone can make VR. Obviously there's a lot going on there that you need to think about, but the tools are there to do it fairly cheaply. And I think that, you know, that stuff, making prototypes, or even if that's even the end thing, I think it's, it can be a very powerful thing that you can do for not a whole lot. Um, It just really depends on what you're aiming to do. I'll just add one more thing about funding. Um, what's been interesting is I think the people who are kind of really making it as independent creators are also the people who can be the most creative with fundraising because besides all the great um, f- uh, uh, funds mentioned earlier, uh, also traditional documentary, f- like Cinereach funded Blackout, like yeah. we're getting, like there's, Dog Wolf has started a whole yeah. initiative that's like focused on immersive. So I think there's like Lest more. Lest we forget brands. Yeah, there's yeah, yeah, plenty yeah. of yeah. corporate money for <laughs> that you can find. Um, so I would say it's like kind of a lo- across the board, different different disciplines and vertical, like everyone's getting in, in, into this somehow. It's important to find the right f- funders for your project. Just yeah. don't throw yourself yes. at everybody with, yeah. you know that though. <laughs> different missions. Yes. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I mean, I agree that I think like the barrier of entry, like for a lot of, you know, uh, I mean, it's still kind of, it's better. Definitely. It's better than it was a few years ago, at least for if you're, as you said, like, you know, trying to prototype something or just like trying to develop an idea. Also worth noting, audio is a big thing. Like Bose released like a, they announced like a Bose AR thing, which is, is, it's AR, but it's just audio. So as a documentarian, like a lot of the great immersive stuff that was coming out, at least initially, was all audio based. Mm-hmm. And so you could imagine all the times you've created really great audio beds and then these poor folks had to watch as you stereoed it and threw it out there in bad speakers on computers and so on. They're just grumbling. But the but the the reality is you can actually use a lot of, you know, besides just the 2D content, you can bring a lot of really great uh, audio back from the from the dead and bring it into the space and be able to have that for people. And that's going to be a, a really big thing. Because for a lot of folks, it's an easier thing to package and deliver than it is like a high fidelity VR video or a, a game engine based experience, I think. So there's other ways that you can be involved in the immersive space. What are, um, maybe, I think we have time for just like one more thing, one more question, but um, 
just like in terms of thinking about the future, um, what if you can name like one thing that to start with uh, that you wish would like get easier that would become like would really change your your workflow? One I mean, thing. it can it can be, it can be more than one thing. Uh, All of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just don't. I can't pick one. I, I know. Okay, I mean, computing power. Multiple. Yes, uh, multiple things. <laughs> computing power is big. Um, I mean, I don't want people putting stuff on their face for that long. Yeah. You know, yeah. I kind of like the holodeck idea. If I had to, like, it's just it's it's kind of unfortunate that we need to strap a bunch of stuff on people. It's like we know you don't even need this, but also, can you strap all this stuff on your face and experience it for me for yeah. thirty minutes? Like, I think, I think that's a, that's a challenge because you know the barrier to entry. Like, it's it's amazing when someone gets to the point where they're actually experiencing it. It's kind yeah. of a, a miracle. So I think. Um, Figuring out, you know, lighter weight solutions, better you, you know, UI UX design, better platforms that don't look janky. Like, you know, thinking about how to build for your audience a bit more. I think a lot of that stuff would be nice if yeah, that stuff I changed think it's a less bit. Less about the creation of these experiences. I, I feel like the tools are always going to get better for creating these experiences. It's less about the creation and it's more about the consumption. There's like a real distribution, distribution yeah. struggle. That yeah, the distribution and hardware we're all waiting on, we're like, come on, let's get there. Yeah. Uh, I, just piggybacking on the distribution side, it's even even um, trying to make revenue <laughs> from these pieces. I think we paid our like one month's rent or something, you know, like it was, it's it's really, the ecosystem really isn't there and, and for, for more of the independent creators and people to be able to fund their own work, there needs to be enough of a just like revenue stream, which is still not there. I don't think people want to pay that much yet if it's like not a game. Um, and on the other side of things, I actually will say for us, it, for me, it is about the creation tools too, since we are in the business of it. Like we are, we, we feel there needs to be a way that right now it's like kind of Frankenstonian the way we work. We have to like merge all the different techniques, all the different cameras, all the different, and if there's just a workflow that's all much more streamlined and pay, p things would work together, it's actually not like that yet right now. Um, so you have to be a bit of a, Hustler and hacker <laughs> to make it all work. Yeah, awesome. Um, I don't think that we have any more questions.